Perfect. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another exciting edition of the Majesta Simpkin School for Human Rights. Uh, I'm, of course, as usual, excited to see everyone here on uh, this Monday, May 24th. As Cecil notes, it is also the 80th birthday uh, for Bob Dylan. Um, today, of course, is going to be one where we kind of dive a bit deeper into the very recent history of activism uh, right here in South Carolina. Of course, the last couple of classes and deeper dive discussions have been examples of how history and activism often mix together. Uh, certainly with our most recent deeper dives, we've been a lot more talking about how do we take what we've learned here in this class and translate it into actual direct action. Um, the most recent class on last week also got a bit in depth into some of the various uh, movements in South Carolina, women's rights movement, LGBTQ movement as well, that have been tied to the state's history over the last 50 years or so. Now this evening, we're gonna get back to talking about that, but looking at it from a different lens. First off, the lens of the anti-war movement uh, during the Vietnam War, 1960s and 70s. Now this topic is, is one that I think most folks have some understanding of, but when we think of the anti-war movement in the 60s, we tend to think about things like Kent State, for example, or massive uh, rallies in Washington, DC. But as you're going to learn this evening, there was also an anti-war movement right here in South Carolina that was also incredibly powerful and was partially influenced and influenced soldiers at Fort Jackson right here in Columbia, South Carolina. We're also going to move into the actual history of GROW, the organization that was the organization that predates the Progressive Network and understand a bit more about what activism looked like on the ground in South Carolina in the 1970s and 1980s. We tend to think about activism in, in the, the context of South Carolina history as being something that happened during, say, the civil rights era, or going back a bit further than that, the Reconstruction era. But in order to understand where activism for human rights is in the Palmetto State right now in 2021, it is absolutely imperative for us to understand activism in the last uh, generation or so that really get a sense of how activism and history intertwine and how this history really informs some of the movements on the ground in the Palmetto State right now. Brett? Thank you, Robert. I don't think you were born when we're gonna start talking here, Robert, but <laughs> pay attention, so pay attention. And everybody has to, uh, no, you don't have to uh, bear with me, but um, Becky and I ran up onto this class after uh, this is the sixth year we've done it, uh, and we hadn't really put the time into it that it needed. And it's talking about things where I was there, and Becky came in in 1991, and it makes it more difficult for us to drink out of a fire hose than in the past. And so there is more that will be added to the study guide as we move along. We didn't get everything in, but uh, trust me, we know this stuff. And we won't leave anything out. But what I wanted to do was start start talking about what it is that we need to know and why we need to know what we need to know about Vietnam. And that uh, we're gonna to have to begin with what, I don't know if you read your, if you read your study guide, uh, you know that, um, let's see, Robert, my, I'm seeing you on my screen and I'm trying to share new speaker view and it's not working. I don't know what other people are saying. Uh, well, Daniel, you're saying, uh, Robert on the screen? I'm seeing you, Brett. Okay, good. And so the the, um, uh, the place that we begin thinking about um, Vietnam is we're going, to, we're going to skip over the stuff that's in your study guide talking about the, the basic premises of the European invasion of the United States and the colonialization of pretty much the entire world by European, European seafaring nations. But that's kind of sets up what then becomes a built-in American foreign policy that we're still practicing. And so this is something that is a, uh, it's a U.S. foreign policy, but we certainly know, and we'll talk about and have talked about in the past, how that U.S. foreign policy has been in, in a significant part shaped by South Carolina politicians and that it affects people in South Carolina. We're, we are a South Carolina-centric um, organization that's trying to create a revolution for values, but we need to understand that we're also American citizens, uh, like it or not, and that some of the things that are happening 
uh, on a federal level, on a national level, on an international level, uh, as we're doing organizing in South Carolina now, we can't change DC till we change SC. So one of our mantras at, at the Progressive Network has been for a long time now, is we need to focus on building the capacity in South Carolina to change who we send to DC. Uh, we can go to DC and protest. I spent a couple of decades going to protest in Washington for regional meetings in Atlanta. And they all ended with this notion, well, now I gotta go home and organize. And so at some point in the past, I decided, well, let's stay home and do that. And so that's what GROW is about. But ultimately, that's what the Progressive Network has been about, is building that capacity in South Carolina of people that understand where we came from, how we got here, where we want to go. And so what, what this initial part about Vietnam in your study guide, which I will not get into the, all the kind of academic details I put in here, but we talk about that uh, early seafaring uh, imperialism. Then we talk about manifest destiny, which was what moved America West, where we found all this land that there were native people on and pretty much took it away from them. And same thing in Mexico. And, and we see monuments on the state house grounds right now for, uh, 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 was it Colonel Travis? I can't remember what, what his rank was. But a South Carolina it plays a famous role in the Alamo and we lifting up the, uh, the land that we stole from uh, Mexico to make Texas. And so that's part of that uh, westward expansion that was kind of related to is the manifest destiny. I mean, it was God's will that the really smart white people go take, take over things. And that, that later became uh, in the, in the mid twenties, a more uh, geocentric uh, doctrine that was referred to as the Monroe doctrine that basically said our manifest destiny isn't just from coast to coast of the United States. It's, the entire Western Hemisphere. And so we claim Central America, South America basically took over many of the country's governments down there because they had our bananas and all kinds of other things that we needed. Overthrew governments. Um, Guatemala was one of the early ones in 54 by the United Fruit Company of all people actually organized a, a coup in, uh, in Guatemala. And so as we move uh, into more recent time, uh, we're finding that the, the colonization efforts that uh, were shared by uh, European countries divided up the emerging nations, the developing nations they were referred to. And so the United States had their own uh, brand of imperialism. We, we called them uh, protectorates, so, so much nicer than calling them colonies. But uh, that American imperialism was again, predicated on some sense of exceptionalism. So when we go halfway around the world or even just down into South America uh, to uh, send in, generally send in the missionaries first to soften folks up and then the troops, uh, it's being done to actually help these people out. These poor people need an economy because they need to be able to trade things. So we, we would generally set up what would, what's called an extractive economy where we take the raw material, bring it back to the United States and make it. And so that, that's a, that led us up into Vietnam. Uh, skip over a lot of the details here that you're going to read about when you do your study guide. And that Vietnam um, was referred to as French Indochina uh, in the early days of my life. And it was um, a French colony. And it was a French colony most of the 1800s leading up to uh, the Japanese invasion, uh, 1941. And so this French colony was an extractive colonialism they called it a colony and that it was just it was predicated on that same kind of uh, exceptionalism that the french had that the americans had when we went into a foreign country and we were there to help them help we were there to help ourselves and that the um, the french uh didn't really put up much of a fuss when the japanese came into to vietnam in, in 1951 but the vietnamese did you see the Vietnamese, the people that actually lived there, the indigenous people had been fighting the French for about 80 years. And uh, the, the, um, the Chinese had made Vietnam a colony going back another uh, few centuries. And so the Vietnamese, there was a Vietnamese like any people, they, they had a sense of nationalism, a sense of place, a sense of ownership of the property. 
And so they fought whoever the hell it was that was oppressing them. It had been the Chinese, then it was the French, then it was the Japanese. So when the Japanese took over France, the, the, Viet, the Viet Minh, which was the indigenous guerrilla group, um, they started fighting the Japanese. And guess who came to help them? The OSS, the, the Office of Special Services, which was the precursor of the CIA. And so we had, we, we had uh, an involvement in Vietnam when the French, right after World War II, when the war ended in, in 45, um, the French, there was an expectation that the Viet Minh, now led by Ho Chi Minh, everybody hopefully remembers that Uncle Ho uh, was kind of the, the George Washington of, um, of Vietnam. And I don't make slight of him to be called the George Washington because Ho Chi Minh left Vietnam as a young man traveled the world as a sailor, spent time in Manhattan and in Paris, ended up going to college, getting degrees in Paris, uh, and being involved in the, the founding of the French Communist Party. And the, the, the reason he got involved in the French Communist Party is they opposed French colonialism in Vietnam. So he found French people that thought like he did. And so he joined up with them. And, and so Ho was d doing the expat thing where he's in France and, and his Buddies in Vietnam, the Viet Minh were, were fighting the French, and then they're fighting the Japanese. And Ho goes back when they start fighting the Japanese. And when the war was over in 45, there was a lot of expectations that the Vietnamese were going to get their country back. Ho, Ho was really moving in very high level waters. He, he was hooked up with French people um, back in the 20s. And after World War I, uh, Ho presented to President Woodrow Wilson a request to help him decolonize Vietnam during the, uh, the, the uh, Versailles peace talks after World War I, where again, the big countries are chopping up the colonies. And so Ho got ignored in the 20s. Uh, and after World War II, the Americans are working with the Viet Minh to fight the Japanese. Our, our secret police, our secret arm of special forces, the, uh, the, pr the precursor of the CIA, is helping uh, the, the Viet Minh fight against the French. And Uncle Ho writes a Declaration of Independence that starts off with all men are created equal. He copied the American Declaration of Independence. He asked President Truman to help. And that, it was Roosevelt at the time, I think when he first started talking, and so there was an expectation after World War II that Vietnam was going to get to be Vietnam for the first time in a long time. And that, damn, if the United States didn't agree to support the French recolonization. So and after the war, we started supporting. And I, I have in the, the, um, the study guide how many, how, much, how many billions of dollars, 44.5 billion in today's money we poured into the French colonial uh, recolonization of Vietnam after World War II. And then the French couldn't hang on to it. And there's something to learn there when you're fighting an indigenous people on their own land, for their own land, you're probably going to lose. You're probably going to fight a real long war and then lose. And so the French gave up. And so the United States simply said, well, this won't do. We were going to help the French be able to get our, you know, rubber, tin, copper, the stuff that you're getting out of Vietnam. And so what the United States did uh, after Dien Bien Phu, which was uh, the time when the French got, it was a, the, the final hurrah for the French and they pulled out, I think it was in 52, Robert, is that right? And that, um, that the United States then put the old emperor that nobody liked in charge and he didn't last long. And then they put in a, uh, another guy. Um, they put in what we see happening around the world, somebody that they acclaim as, as a righteous leader that's going to lead this country to democracy and freedom. And the democracy is always really kind of free enterprise, free in the market, a free market where you people will get to participate in the joys and, and pleasures of unrestrained capitalism. And it will really help you out in the long run. And so that the United States initial military involvement in Vietnam was 1954 with what was called the Military Assistance Advisory Group, MAG. 
And so it, it, we had the mag groups on the ground uh, in 54, and it just slowly started building up. And that the, uh, the, the time that, well, actually, I lived in Taiwan in 1954 to 58. So I was just a tyke. I uh, was six to 10, six to 10 years old. My father was an oral surgeon in the Navy who had been lent to the State Department. And he was Chiang Kai-shek's dentist for four years. So we hung out in the palace. I thought they treated everybody like royalty, but my father was the generalissimo's dentist. And so we had a really nice time there. I, I remember things, I saw things, but I didn't have the analysis that I had not that much long later to understand that the man was a fascist, that he'd stolen this country from the indigenous uh, Taiwanese. But there, there were um, bombings. Uh, the Chinese did not like the Kuomintang moving to, China, moving to Taiwan. And so there was, uh, after Mao took over in 48 in, um, in China, Chiang Kai-shek moved to Taiwan and there was, there's fighting still going on. They're still talking, they're still, they were shelling in Kuimoy and Matsu, those are two little islands that Taiwan claims right off of, uh, uh, off of Chinese border. And that um, yesterday they were shelling Kuimoy and Matsu, China was. This is, I mean, yesterday, today's yesterday, not then yesterday. And so that, that whole area there, the United States moved American troops into Taiwan and uh, Vietnam and the Philippines. And then the American troops started amassing. And um, let's see, what we're gonna do here next. I actually have an agenda here, folks. Um, I think that we can, we can start with the 1965 Thurman speech. Daniel, can you cue that up for us? You got it. Now, what? Now, rem remember now before you start, Daniel, that the um, what happened now. This is really important. Is that we had earlier been helping this French colonial effort, and when we went back in, we didn't want to call it our colony. What it was was it was now to stop communism. So Vietnam is really important that you understand that Vietnam was the first major um, foreign war that, that the United States was involved in after World War II. That's when the Cold War started. But that's when communism became the big boogeyman. And so it was, you've heard Lee Atwater talk about it. They needed an other. You got to have somebody to blame things on because our people are too stupid to get upset. And so what the, the in Vietnam, we were there fighting communism. And Strom Thur Thurman in 1965, after one of the big anti-war um, protests, gives this little clip that Dan is going to play now. The civil disobedience campaigns protesting United States involvement in Vietnam, which erupted on the weekend of October the 16th in the most massive demonstrations to date, mark a sharp new success for the communists. It gives a clear signal that the communists are operating again through the popular front tactic, which they first displayed in the United States in the early 1930s. The degree to which communists now operate in the open is evident from the remarks of Gus Hall, secretary of the Communist Party USA, who recently bragged, and I quote, fronts are a thing of the past. We don't need them. We've got the W.E.B. Du Bois clubs, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Students for a Democratic Society going for us. But they are not fronts of the usual sense of the word. They are just a part of the responsible left, that portion of American youth that realizes American society is safe, end quote. Rigid enforcement of the laws can stem this tide, and it should be demanded by every responsible American. Thank you, Strom. He recognized that the youth of today was responsible people trying to do the right thing. He quoted Gus Hall saying that. And so when he gave that speech, 
we only had like 23,000 troops in Vietnam. And at the beginning of that year, only 400 people had died. By 1967, three years later, we had nearly a half a million young men in Vietnam and 23,000, 23, 23,000 had died. And one of the things that's happened with the pandemic now, when we have like thousand people a day dying, it's really diminished death in terms of numbers. They're hard to grasp. You've got to remember that Vietnam was not only the first anti-communist saving, you know, we're going to burn your village to save your village. It was the first television war. Daniel, have you got that clip by uh, Walter Cronkite queued up? Walter Cronkite, this is back when there were only three TV stations and people actually believed Walter. He, he was so credible and he was a nice guy. And this is what he had to say about Vietnam. Daniel? In 1968, television was still a relatively young technology. Most American households had a TV, but three out of four sets were still black and white. There were three major TV networks, and they regularly carried footage from Vietnam, some of it beamed by satellite. The footage was raw and powerful. The Vietnam War became known as the Living Room War. At the end of January 1968, the Viet Cong, along with North Vietnamese Army regulars, launched the coordinated surprise attack known as the Tet Offensive. Americans at home were shocked to see street fighting in Saigon, including within the compound of the U.S. Embassy. On a single day, January 31st, 1968, 246 Americans were killed in Vietnam or were mortally wounded in combat. In New York, CBS News anchor Walter Cronkite was among those bewildered by Tet. He decided to go to Vietnam himself and provide his viewers with an assessment of the war's progress. His one-hour special report aired in prime time on the night of February 27th. These ruins are in Saigon, capital and largest city of South Vietnam, Cronkite began, standing in front of a destroyed building. He reported from across the country, including from the ongoing Battle of Way, where Americans and their South Vietnamese allies were fighting house to house and room to room. At the end of the special report, Cronkite, shown in New York, gave his ultimate assessment. He said, it now seems more certain than ever that the bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe in the face of the evidence, the optimists who have been wrong in the past. There's a famous anecdote, possibly apocryphal, that after President Johnson saw the broadcast, he said, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost middle America. What's certain is that Johnson on March 31st announced that he would not seek reelection. The war continued for another seven years before the communists claimed victory. Critics say the news media undermined the American war effort, but Cronkite and other journalists managed to expose the gap between what the US government was saying about Vietnam and what was really happening on the ground. All this remains controversial. The history of the Vietnam War is still being written. The Walter Cronkite, good night. Uh, the history is still being written. Uh, and <laughs> we're, we're helping write it, folks. Because one of the lessons, there's some takeaways here. What, you know, what, what do we learn from Vietnam? And one of them is that our government lies. In the Pentagon Papers, we, there, Daniel Ellsberg was a, um, an analyst for the RAND Corporation. That is, and, and the RAND Corporation was hired by the Pentagon to do this study on Vietnam. Why are we losing, why are we getting our butts kicked so badly? And it told the truth. And um, Daniel Ellsberg um, decided he needed to release that. And he was, he was arrested and charged with espionage. And uh, the Pentagon Papers were then run on the front page of every major newspaper in America. And so the diminution of people's belief in the, the, their government's foreign policy was certainly leveraged by Vietnam and people understanding that we had been lied to. And it, it's apparent that they can continue lying to people and getting away with things. That's where our work comes in in terms of doing education. Um, another major element of the takeaway is like the, the utilization of the, the, the communist dominoes, the domino theory. Um, 
Eisenhower spoke of the domino theory about how the way it is, is that one, one country will fall and one next door will fall and one next door will fall. And um, the domino theory was, gave us enough reason to try and what they call contain communism. We were gonna contain communism in this small piece of earth called South Vietnam. And um, one of the things that was overlooked in this theory is that the Vietnamese didn't like the, the Chinese. The Vietnamese didn't like the, the, the Russians. The Vietnamese wanted to be Vietnamese. They wanted their own country. And so that's, that's kind of a standard trope we see when we go into some country, let's think of one. Oh, Afghanistan, that's right. And so there are people that live there, um, but we kind of like think that they're wrong. And so we like anoint somebody to be the leader. And after 20 years and about 4,000 American dead and a whole bunch of Afghanis dead, that's not working very well for us. That's that the wash, rinse and repeat cycle of predatory foreign policy that seems like a mistake to most people, but somebody's getting rich. And there's that old saying, rich man's, rich, rich, rich man's war, poor man's fight. And speaking of poor man's fight, the other thing we learned is don't draft the middle class or just don't, just don't have an open draft and take kids out of college and stuff like that. I had three pre-induction physicals at Fort Jackson. And it got to a point where they could get out. It may push up. It'd be 150, 200 people in the room. Okay, everybody made that next. And so it was, the threshold kept lowering and lowering. And by, um, I think it was pretty well around 1967 that they lowered the, the requirements and increased the, the drafting of minorities. And by 69, 25% of the combat troops were black. And it's like only 9% of the draftees were black and that was about the percentage of the United States. And so there was a predatory nature going on of who was, it, who was going into the foxholes and who was getting killed. A disproportionate number of people of color being killed there. Not a new story. But these are, these are all things that just bred a tremendous amount of unrest that people could see the linkages between whether you were a Black Panther or SDS I, I can't remember what other groups that uh, Comrade Thurman cited as being in the United Front at the time. But this was an understanding that this was a war that was affecting all of us. Though there were, the numbers seem small now in comparison to the pandemic in terms of death. The, in 69, there were a thousand people a day, and at that day, a thousand people a month died. 460 something in one day at Tet, which kind of like, that's what got Walter going to Vietnam. But that thousand a month is like 30 a day. And the networks at the end of their program would scroll the names in every living room in America, in every town in America, every county had a draft board. Everybody over 18 had to register. We couldn't even vote. I couldn't vote till I was 21. I could drink, I could drink beer. I could kill people, I could get killed if I couldn't vote. And so there were just tremendous, as are hard, usually contradictions between who's like fighting and who is winning here. And so that this TV war that was so spread out, basically kind of a democratic thing the draft is, you know, that it involved everybody. And this is why we saw what we saw that went on with the protest. <laughs> but um, one of the things that, um, it was really provocative, was a rally in Washington, D.C. Richard Nixon had just been elected in November 1968 with a promise to wind down the war. Um, Lyndon Johnson, after, after Walter gave his, his speech on TV about we can't win it, Johnson was quoted as saying, if I've lost Walter, I've lost America. And he, he didn't run again, he quit. And Nixon ran on winding down a war and, and ran against Hubert Humphrey. And some of you that are old enough or have studied, remember the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago. Um, it was um, a, real, a real moment for a lot of people, myself included, about the, the, the ability and the will of the Democratic Party, the system, so to speak, the system fixing itself. See, the system kind of feeds on itself. The system protects itself. And that's one of the reasons that in the progressive network, we have a political theory called the inside-outside theory. 
We can't fix the inside with the tools the inside use to create itself and maintain itself. We have to be inside, be effective, and know what they're doing, and gather the strength outside to be able to use it inside to change the way business is run. And so that's part of what we're hopefully seeing uh, with the progressive network. But the um, after Nixon was taken had taken office, the next big demonstration was in um, Washington D.C. Uh, we took a a bunch up from South Carolina and uh, Country Joe played and he sang that song again and there were a half a million people there it's referred to as one of the biggest if not the biggest gathering in, in Washington but I, there were people literally from the steps of the Capitol all the way back to the monument and Country Joe sang the, the, the fish song there and he has this thing called the fish cheer where he goes, give me an F, give me an I, give me an S, give me an H and it's the fish he, at the end of that song, did the fish cheer, but he said, give me an F, and the crowd responded. Give me a U, and the crowd responded. Give me a C, and the crowd responded heartily, and he said, give me a K, what's that spell? A half a million people screaming fuck on the, on the mall with Richard Nixon reported peeking out the window of the White House listening. <laughs> That's a very interesting way of, to communicate people power to the president of the United States. Very effective anyway, I enjoyed it. Vietnam vets throwing their medals over, over onto the steps of the Capitol. And um, the war waged on. And Nixon certainly um, waged it heartily. And we're gonna just kind of skip ahead to the bombing of Cambodia. And the bombing of Cambodia was announced in uh, May 1970. And see, well, there's some things happened in 69 we want to refer to. I was, I was arrested for, no, that was in 70. In 1969, there were other things that happened. One of the things that, that's in your study guide, there should be, is that AWARE, the AWARE group at the University of South Carolina uh, was started in 66. And it was a more of a discussion group than it was by 68 when I came on campus. But uh, one of the big things that AWARE did um, at the time was um, a protest that uh, Tom, uh, Thomas Tidwell participated in. And Dr. Tidwell was a history professor at the university. And yeah, those of you that have been on campus know the, uh, the Rutledge Chapel on the Horseshoe. The university gave uh, General Westmoreland, who was the commanding general of Vietnam at the time, an honorary doctorate. And uh, Dr. Tidwell stood up with a sign, said, I protest doctorate of war and walked out. And it just caused quite a kerfuffle. It was just unacceptable to do things like that. And um, then the next year, 68, was a very, a very hard year. I mean, it started hard and got worse. Um, we know that um, Dr. King was killed in April. February 8th, the, the, the Orangeburg Massacre happened. Um, by, oh, it was March of 70 when I did the draft board thing. And, and I got arrested like the next day in the Russell House by the state police at a hearing by the, by the Student Affairs Committee to determine if a where's charter should be revoked because we weren't playing by the rules. And by then we'd been protesting the war in Vietnam for a couple of years on campus. And then we're right on a good day, we could get 300 people to do something. And, uh, and most of them, unfortunately, were not from South Carolina. Uh, I say unfortunately, just because it just evidenced the mentally adequate education that brought the South Carolinians to college. So the, the work that we had been doing was setting up tables, passing out literature. I had become the traveler for the Southern Student Organizing Committee in 68. Yeah, I was at University of Georgia in 66, graduated from Sarita Buford High School in 66, and lived on the military base, Paris Island. My father, remember, was in the Navy. He was a doctor on Paris Island. And so I was living on the Marine Corps Recruit Depot when it was gearing up for Vietnam. And there were, I think, there was like 10,000 when it started. By the time I graduated, I think it was 17,000 young men there. A lot of them are older than me. They had no idea what Vietnam was about. I got into long arguments with my father about, isn't Vietnam just a, a colonial war? And isn't that what we fought King George for? 
And he really had no interest in that. And that uh, I didn't find anybody that was running the government or acting for the government or being told to go kill for the government that actually understood what, you know, just as a young guy, I'd figured out because I was enamored with, with foreign policy and wanted to grow up and be a diplomat. Thought I'd work for the State Department. Actually, I am a diplomat. I'm just working on a different side of the street. But that the the the, the soldiers there were clueless as to what they were doing. And that the by the time that I got to the University of Georgia, um, I, I got involved in the Southern Student Organizing Committee, which was left the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 64. SNCC, of course, was um, a black organization that was into direct action that was considered by the NAACP and the other more established black groups to be a little radical. And you remember, those of you that have been paying attention, that the Southern Negro Youth Congress was a militant organization that was wiped out by the feds, a uh, multiracial, class conscious, militant organization that was wiped out by the Red Scare by 1960. And so there was a, a, a dry spell, early 60s. Uh, Ella Baker gets going with, with SNCC. Uh, and there were white people going on Mississippi Freedom Summer and stuff like that with, with uh, SNCC. And after a couple of years, um, it became apparent to everyone involved that, that the white people that were helping going into the black neighborhoods uh, and getting beat up would be much better off going to white colleges talking to white people because racism was a problem you could probably find more problem in the white college. And so Southern Student Organizing Committee was formed in 64. I became a member in 66, participated in a demonstration at the University of Georgia against Lester Maddox, an uh, open Klansman who won in eighth grade education and won proudly holding up his little matchbook showing the, the school he got his degree from that sent me right off in gift. And um, so I transferred, I ended up at the campus in, um, in Columbia in, in early 68 in time for Dr. King's killing, the Orangeburg killings. Um, see, oh yeah, I burned a flag and got arrested. I burned a Confederate flag on the anniversary of the Orangeburg killings. Uh, at the university, and that was probably the worst thing I ever did in the eyes of, certainly in the eyes of the rednecks of the prison system. But that there was a lot happening in 1968, and that the um, the organization aware was we weren't doing anything necessarily militant. We, we were passing out literature. We were having teach-ins and talking about the longness of the war, how uh, the the racism that that SOC had been dealing with was we were smoothly moved into U.S. imperialism being a racist foreign policy. And that um, we, had, we did really radical things like put up posters with no stamp on them saying approved, and we would move tables and chairs for meetings. And so there was a meeting of the Student Affairs Committee in the Russell House to determine if we were to keep this charter. And the night before, the co-chairs were aware had vandalized the local draft board. This is in, I think it was March 1970, National Anti-Draft League. And um, I, I guess it wasn't too hard to figure out who would do something like that on National Anti-Draft League in Columbia. It wasn't one of my brightest moments. But um, we had talked about doing other things and this other, the go spray paint something on the wall became the, the thing to do. And we did that, spray paint something on the wall, a window was broken, some red paint was thrown on draft records. The next day at this meeting, Sled flies into the meeting room, throws me and Jack Weatherford, the co-chair of the organization, up against the wall and arrests us for the draft board thing. And so that was began a long, uh, a long saga that uh, someday if you buy me a beer, I'll tell you about. But that, that kind of in part set the tone for what was happening. You step out of line and they'll come and take you away. And I was charged with malicious mischief, first offense misdemeanor, and ended up serving. I got sentenced to a year and a half. And they were laughing, they being the people that did the sentencing, because a year and a half sentence is longer than a two-year sentence, but the two-year sentence, you start building good time to get out early. And I ultimately spent nearly two years in prison for spray painting. Hell no, we won't go on the draft board wall. And um, we actually have a picture of that that I don't have ready to queue up. The, um, the work that went on after that um, included a lot of anti-war activity that really launched big time. When Cambodia was invaded, American campuses were shutting down all over the country. 
uh, we had a proposal to strike the University of South Carolina. The student government agreed with it. And then May 4th, Kent State happened. And the strike that um, was going to happen, we, we put up posters. I'm going to share my screen here and see if I can show you the strike poster. These posters went up all over. Can you see that? There you go. These posters went up all over campus. Some of them just had the word strike on them. And some of them said, why we're striking? Because there were cops in the Russell House. They were checking IDs. They wouldn't let people that weren't students in because the communists uh, were working with the anti-war GIs when the UFO coffee house was closed. We're gonna talk about the UFO in a minute. But the UFO was an anti-war coffee house. And when the coffee house was closed, we started hosting it at the university. And the university got, well, the university was leaned on and started prohibiting all these activities. And they, they were undercover agents on campus arresting people for drugs and whatnot. And so these were the, the issues that drove the strike. And um, the, um, the, the, by see the seventh and eighth was supposed to be the, the strike day. And on the day of the seventh, there was a, a teach in and the aware group had organized um, a um, teach in all day long on the, on the Friday at the Russell house. We had all the rooms reserved. We were going to do this teach in all day long. It was as part of the strike we'd been planning. Um, and we had in, initially a whole lot of buy-in from the, some of the, um, the religious groups on campus and the student government was supporting it. But as we got closer to it, Kent State happened, the heat ratcheted up, the governor calls in the student body president. You're not gonna have anything to do with this. You're not gonna have a career. And so when the students went to do the thing at the Russell House, uh, they were told that reservations would be canceled and they, could, they had to leave. And so they didn't. And they sent in the high patrol and then they sent in the National Guard. Then they sent in the Columbia police. And when the, when the National Guard came marching on campus, um, I was standing at the edge of what, right up where Sumter Street runs into Long Street Theater where Sumter and Green Street are conjoined because I had been banned from campus by court order after I was arrested and thrown out, I, I was suspended. They said, you can't come on class except to go to, you can't come on campus except to go to classes. And I kept going to anti-war meetings. And then they said, well, you were expelled. You can't come on campus, period. And I kept going on campus. And then they got a court order banning me from a section of the city. And so I was standing on the edge of my band zone and, uh, and with a walkie-talkie talking to people inside. And, and this is, the, I'm gonna share a screen of that which is that those of us saw uh, at, uh, that were, uh, were at my vantage point, these are the same guys a couple years earlier. They're the ones that killed the people in, in Orangeburg. They had a height requirement that was probably about the same as the IQ requirement for the high patrol, high patrol at that time. These were some mean people. And you may notice that their, their sticks are a bit larger than your standard billy club. And there were, were military-issued 12-gauge buckshot uh, boxes littering the, the sidewalk on Green Street with high patrol cars that started parking at Pickens went all the way back to Assembly Street. And that was before the National Guard came on campus. And we had had, like I said, maybe 300 anti-war folks. And so when the National Guard came on campus, there were a couple thousand people cheering them. And so the, the Strom, Pete Strom, the head of SLED, went in and arrested the people that were um, involved in the, the, they were sitting in the lobby because the rooms had been canceled. And the, the line, the administration's line and things that you read actually have posted in academic piece about that time. The line was the students occupied the Russell House. Uh, excuse me, we had reservations. You took them away from us and we, we stayed. I mean, that's not, call it what you want to, but we actually were playing by the rules. And so they arrested 41 people. And um, a number of those people uh, had to leave the state uh, and a lot of them were expelled. And so this was, 
kind of a, a tendency of South Carolina to be able to quash rebellion. And we've seen that if you're black, they shoot you um, or, or you leave the state. And they were doing that with the best and brightest in South Carolina. And we'll bring that up again when we talk about the UFO. So let, let's pause for a minute, Robert, catch the breath. Has he got any questions in the chat that we can address before we wait deeper into those? Um, you know, I don't see any questions in the chat, although I, I did want to add something to what you just mentioned. Uh, if you, if any of you go on the campus of the University of South Carolina today, uh, some of the buildings that were built in the 1970s were built specifically to dissuade students from gathering and organizing in protest. Uh, for example, the building that I took most of my classes in Gambrough Hall, it was designed, if you go into it now, uh, the building, you can tell it was designed to prevent mass meetings because of the way it was built. There's no, there's a, there's a lobby area, but it's not really centralized in the way some of the older buildings are, some of the newer buildings are. That was uh, a design trait you see on many college campuses in the 1960s and 70s because of these kinds of activities. Uh, secondly, I wanted to also drop in the chat, uh, I mentioned this to Brett over the weekend, but there is a, a master's thesis written by a friend of mine uh, at U of SC, Alyssa Konstad, about this time period, um, about the protest on campus in the late 60s and early 70s. And it, it puts into scholarly context a lot of what Brett's talking about this evening. In fact, uh, there are actually uh, in the footnotes, some of the letters Brett himself wrote back in the late 60s and early 70s about what's going on. Uh, so again, this, this gives some further context to what Brett's talking about this evening in terms of protest and the anti-war movement in the late 60s and early 70s. Thank you, Robert. I trust we'll have some questions as we move along here. Um, Daniel, do you have um, uh, the first clip that we're calling UFO related? Now, this is a clip at the university uh, after they, cl they closed the UFO in January. Um, 70 and it had it had opened in january 68 so it was open for two years and it, it was a coffee house and it was started by um quakers the quakers funded it and that the um the the people that ran it were really well educated very polite you know people that are like quakers and the the uh the idea of Fred Gardner, who we're gonna hear from a minute after the conviction of the people. We, there's a clip of Fred being interviewed by the media. And that um, the, um, the UFO was expressly started to support anti-war GIs, to encourage GIs to speak out against the war. There had never been any, any real clarity on where the line of of insubordination or conduct on becoming starts or finishes in any kind of mass way. There were there were the draft resistors and people who were refused going all the way back every war we've ever had, but never on the level that we're seeing in Vietnam. And that um, that the, uh, the UFO coffee house actually encouraged that. That actually, I, we actually helped GIs that wanted to flee go to Canada. Um, the the, the uh, staff of the UFO and I worked closely with them and supporting the anti-war GIs. And that uh, there was a group that started in 1968, let me back up a, a year, 1967 was the first thing that got national and international attention. And the reason that the UFO was in Columbia was Fort Jackson. And the, the reason that the UFO anti-war coffee house for GIs outside of training bases started that process that ultimately ended up with the, the, the Friends, the American Friends Service Committee, the Quaker money, and they started a group called the United Service, U.S. Servicemen's Fund. And it was uh, for these coffee houses to be, to try and talk the soldiers into not fighting. Columbia was chosen as the first one. And uh, it, in part because of what had preceded it, which was Howard Levy. Dr. Howard Levy was a doctor uh, at Fort Jackson in 1967. And Dr. Levy was supposed to teach special forces medics how to take care of people in Vietnam. He said, I can't do that. 
that would be against the Nuremberg rules. And I have to refuse that to the legal order because what we're doing in Vietnam is killing civilians, et cetera. And so they arrested Dr. Levy and the, the case that was brought against him and his defense, his defense attracted more attention perhaps than the case did because he made the Nuremberg argument. He made the argument, this war is illegal and it got global attention and that he lost and ended up serving a couple of years in Leavenworth, but it really did ring the bell and generated a lot of um, uh, anti-war sentiments that were spreading, not just in the communities, but on the bases. The next year, 1968, at Fort Jackson, there was a group of eight soldiers that started an organization called GIs United Against the War in Vietnam. They were in uniform on the base having meetings against the war in Vietnam. Well, they were told, you can't do that. That's insubordinate. And they brought charges against them, locked them up a bit, and then let them go because there was so much dust kick. Because the question of free speech on the base really had never been litigated. And so there was another huge case with lawyers that, the, some of the lawyers that were dealing with this at the time, they were really well-known civil rights and human rights attorneys before the era of ambulance chasing attorneys that grandstand on representing celebrities that kill their wives and things like that. And so the, the, some of the attorneys that stepped in to do this were attorneys that actually helped Julian Bond get his seat back in the legislature in 1968 when the Georgia legislature wouldn't seat Bond because he was against the war in Vietnam. He won an election. So, and other lawyers uh, had, uh, were Muhammad Ali's lawyer when he refused to fight and won that case. Um, and that, so there was a lot of firepower brought in, big news right here in Columbia. And so that's how the UFO got here in 68. And so Dana, what, we've got another clip of people marching around. Um, the city hall is right across the street from the UFO. And you know, if you've been to Columbia and you know where the city hall is, the corner of Laurel and Main Street, you can see the Capitol right down the street. The UFO is in rented space right across the street. And that was a pretty big space. And, and in the two years that it was there, I mean, Norman Mailer spoke there. Um, Phil Oaks, famous folk singer, sang there. Uh, Drink Small sang there repeatedly. And um, we went there and we had meetings and, and there were GIs that would come. And uh, that was just a coffee house. It had food. It had radical propaganda. And key that up, Dana. So this is the UFOs closed down on, on uh, January um, 70. And these are students immediately. With a couple of days later, a student march around them, around the city hall, uh, protesting. And there's no sound in this, so it's, it's not our fault. These are clips that Becky dug up from the moving image resource. What is it, Becky? This is Gonzalo Leon, a, a Cuban expatriate. Um, and these are people, some of which I recognize from AWARE. This was an AWARE hosted thing. They all look so nice and, and reason, responsible human beings that Tom Thurman identified. And so this, you can't quite see the UFO, but it was right straight across the street. And when they went in, they padlocked the door. They put chains around the handle, arrested the people in there, the five people. One of them was the wife of one of the people who was arrested. She was pregnant, they let her go. And somebody else who was, I think, just helping out that night. So they actually ended up charging three people with first offense misdemeanor for keeping and maintaining a public nuisance. That law had, no one had ever gone to jail for that law for the first offense to begin with. And then it was, it had only previously been used for houses of prostitution. And there were no offenses that, it, that there were no fights that brought the police. There was no drug dealing that brought the police. And so the, the offense was simply what they were talking about. And Daniel stopped the film. And I just noticed a couple of days ago, looking at these clips that Becky dug up, that's Jack Weatherford right there. Jack was my co-chair of the, the AWARE SDS SOC chapter. 
at, uh, at the University of South Carolina in 1968 and 69. And, well, Aware was uh, scrubbed by the, the, the administration uh, after the draft board event. We lost our charter. And that um, Jack Weatherford was a coach here, one of my better friends, um, spent a lot of time with him. And he was arrested with me at the draft board thing. And, um, we, well, we were arrested the next day. Jack went to the draft board and uh, threw, threw a brick and I don't know, he spray painted something. But um, Jack didn't, Jack had a different lawyer than I did. The trial was out of August. And Jack had sat in with my attorney and I, who was an ACLU attorney, young ACLU attorney, Rock Wise from Greenwood planning our defense the lawyer that jack had set in with us multiple times and he actually encouraged me to leave he said you better you better go underground man they're going to get you and the next day you know we met with jack the night before they called the first witness for the prosecution jack weatherford my coach here my good friend my brother and the first question for mr weatherford after i read the indictment was mr weatherford how long have you been an agent for the state law enforcement division he said about a year and a half what was your job at SLED? Watch Mr. Bernstein. And that I understood finally what a blown mind was. I couldn't process that. It was my this guy, my buddy, who was really articulate about the war in Vietnam, very progressive on women's issues. He actually hooked up with a woman that um, we had introduced him to, who had left her liberal husband, who was the son of the sitting Mendel Rivers, a sitting U.S. congressman, because he was a liberal and she wanted a radical. So she hooked up with Weatherford. She didn't know he was a cop. Now he wasn't he wasn't under under un, he wasn't an informer. He was an agent, a sled agent. And so that was really something. Um, after Weatherford testified, it was pretty clear I was going to jail and a very interesting uh, transcript that someday we'll post online. But uh, that was a period when we realized how thoroughly what we did was was surveilled by the police and that um, it was just, it's a lesson, lesson learned. The more effective you get, the, the more pressure you bring down. And so I ended up fleeing. I did go underground after I was convicted uh, because somebody came to see me that worked for the prison system. And um, he said, they're talking about killing you. They say, who's they? He says, the Klan people down there. And they, were, they didn't care about Vietnam. They were really pissed off I'd burned the Confederate flag. And so uh, I decided the best thing to do was to run away and live to fight another day and spend about a year on the ground before they called me and brought me back. And so Daniel, let, let's just go on to, there's all we have here is people walking around in circles. We just wanted to share that little piece about my good friend, Jack Weatherford, who went on, he got his degree in sociology, uh, went on to work for the Heritage Foundation and uh, has written books, um, well-respected sociologists, especially in Mongolia. We're in a tribe called Tribes on the Hill where he analogizes the uh, culture of politicians in Washington to tribalism. And uh, he's retired now, living in Charleston, and I really don't have anything to say to him. So, uh, Daniel, the next clip is, I can't, I, I can't remember what the protest is. Is it another one that's with Jay Hayes in it? But, but play that next clip, it's only a few seconds long. That cop there we just saw with the hat on was um, uh, Earl Dennis was the name of him, and he beat up a number of people right now. Oh, this is the same. This is the same clip, Daniel. We've got that backwards. We can just go on. Let's see. the uh, The next one is we're getting into the UFO now, and the, the the three people that were arrested. Daniel, put up the clip of the people getting out of the the paddy wagon there at the at the, the county building. Um, the um, the three people arrested I mentioned they were charged with misdemeanor, and they were sentenced to, to uh, six years in prison, and they and they fined ten thousand dollars to the company, and when they padlocked the door we never got back in. All the stuff got lost. All the food was in the freezer, was rotted, and so it was it was pretty mean. It was pretty brutal, and um, show that clip, Daniel, and we'll see uh, the people that I will tell you who they were. Or still are, I hope. Is that not coming up? 
Here we go. Well, that's Fred. Let's go with Fred. That's okay. That skip the one with the, the arrestees in it. But play that one, Daniel. This is the guy that after the arrest, this is Fred Gardner. He's the one that started the UFO. And he was not there. He moved on to start other things. Have a hangout, a place they could gather in a non-military atmosphere and discuss the things that were really on their mind. Did you sell any alcoholic beverages there? No, we didn't. It was a coffee house. Did you have any trouble with drug pushers or users? On occasion, they tried to operate out of the UFO. We expelled them and we made an offer to the police, not of we wouldn't finger anybody, but if they would supply us with names and pictures of people they knew to be pushers, we would talk to them at the door and try and keep them out on, you know, using our own methods. Did you form it basically because you're opposed to the war in Vietnam and wish to influence soldiers? For both moral and tactical grounds, I never tried to influence soldiers. I always had the feeling that if and when men got a sense of their true numbers and realized how many hundreds, how many thousands of them were choking with shame and angry and unwilling to, to go to Vietnam, they would find ways of expressing their own feelings. So as a place for a GI to hang out. What's wrong with Bob Hope and Martha Ray and Ping Pong? Nothing. It's just that uh, people, you know, want, there's another culture in this country. Thank you, Dan. Um, so that, Fred was the fellow that started the coffee houses and went on to start one in uh, Colleen, Texas and Boise, Idaho. And ultimately there were five of them. And uh, they all drew heat. But the, the one that was, <laughs> that was shut down was the one in Columbia. And those people, um, Will Balk, um, Lenny Cohen, uh, and uh, Dwayne Frey, uh, we're in the clip that we didn't get to see now, but these will all be up on the website and you can see them later. But um, Will was the only one from South Carolina that was on the staff. And he was from Blackville, South Carolina, a lovely man. And um, they all lived in a, a commune. And I think that's where communists live. And that um, it was a, a really vibrant and fun place to go. It's where we printed the strike posters and ran off stuff. We had the mimeograph machine in those days. But um, that was um, uh, a beloved community. It was delightful. And that uh, uh, Lenny Cohen was um, a conscious objective. And he had signed up to work at the, at the UFO to carry on his struggle. Um, and uh, Dwayne Ferre was a army lieutenant who refused to go to Vietnam, who spent, uh, I think, a year and a half in Leavenworth before he signed up with the Quakers to work at the coffee house. And so these were people that were had been in the trenches and were paying back and, and sharing uh, really heartfelt sentiments about the, the, the wrongness of the war in Vietnam. And they, had, they, they, they were given six years and they were told leave or go to prison. And they too left. Um, I ran into Dwayne Frey a couple of years later in Austin. Um, I haven't kept up with him. Uh, Will Balk, last time I checked, our, our friend from South Carolina, was the curator of fabrics for the Smithsonian having a large time in Washington. But uh, that's the UFO coffee house is something that uh, was real special and we'll have more information on that that you can go back to on uh, for class seven. They'll remain posted. Um, we got this out late and you didn't have time to read it all. And we're gonna spiff it up and you can, we'll send you a note when it's, it's in better shape. And so we're gonna now talk about the Vietnam protest. Daniel, we're going to start off this Vietnam piece about this is the campus protest uh, with um, Saul Blot, uh, who Solomon Blot was the kingpin of what was called the Barnwell Ring. Solomon Blot was Speaker of the House for over 30 years. His buddy, Ed Brown was president pro tem of the Senate for the same time. And so these two guys from Barnwell ran South Carolina for 30 years, from the 30s up to the 60s. Uh, it's no wonder that the bomb plant, uh, also known as the Savannah River plant, um, was located uh, 
snugly nestled between Aiken and Barnwell, 312 square miles of property that was condemned by the federal government in 1950 to make nuclear weapons. And ironically, Strom Thurmond was the lawyer for all the people in the, the two main little towns, Dumbarton and New Ellington, that were on that 312 square mile piece. Um, they had to move. They either they literally picked up their houses, put them on trucks, and moved them. Uh, dug up the graveyards, but uh, the streets are still there. They, they make an interesting field trip someday. We'll take folks down to visit the bum plant. We call it the BUM, the bum plant. But Simon Bot was big time favorite the bomb plant. And I talked with him when we first started organizing down there. And uh, he said, before the bum plant came, we didn't have any time, uh, any brick houses. Now everybody's got a brick house. And so that that was it. We could trade nuclear weapons for brick houses anytime. Play that that clip from Mr. Blot talking about them protesters. Uh, I wish there was some way that I could be present down there for about 60 to 90 days. Uh, I throw every one of them off the campus. Now, Tom Jones, as president, is doing a marvelous job. He has some on the faculty that ought to be run off. He has these students that ought to be run off. But he has brought in an outstanding faculty, and he's got some outstanding students. And we must look to the good men on the faculty, to the good men on the uh, uh, in the administration, and to the good men on the board of trustees, and to the good boys and girls who are down there, and measure the worth and value of the university by their conduct, and not by the conduct of two, uh, 200 or 200. 150 uh, boys and girls uh, who uh, brought disgrace to themselves, to their families, to the university, and to the state of South Carolina. I think that the vast majority of students at the university are opposed to, to this form of dissent at the university. Now, by that, I mean this, that when you speak to the president of the University of South Carolina and you have dissent, that's fine. When you have a list of, of objectives you want to talk about, but when you start calling him obscene names and when you start calling other people that are there as guests obscene names and when you start just taking things in your own hands i think that's wrong and i don't care what you say about it thank you daniel so solomon block uh, was the main person running politics in south carolina and that was that was before that was before all the people were arrested even but i've uh, we'll get into what he had to say about me in a minute here, but the um, uh, next clip, Daniel, is the rally on the horseshoe, and this was May 7th, and so it was after Kent State, but before the Russell House when all the people were arrested, and um, we'll see a couple different opinions. This was hosted, this is put on by the university as a kind of a talk back thing. Man, you think God, you think man, they're gonna just let you go because you white. You know you are the new niggas. You are the new niggas. They gonna teach you just like the dogs. Hands and we're gonna do something about it. They whip your hands and you just sit there, man. And I'm just sitting there watching y'all sit there. The taxpayers of this state pay an extra thousand dollars for each one of you out of state students to come here. It would seem to me that you owe something to this state, and that is to have respect for it and its tradition. How much longer will the taxpayers of this state sit by and let you destroy it? Uh, so I just want to let you know that when you hear in the news tonight that McNair met with students and got no response, it was not, it was not like it was reported. Students went there, they went there with demands, they went there with reasons. Thank you, Daniel. That's no. That first, the first picture there, this is a route, that was a picture of people on the state house steps there. But that first person talking, I don't know who that was, but he was spot on um, that the, we're, we're now, remember now, we're coming after the a year after the Orange River Massacre. And there had been some pretty serious pushback around that. 
and so this, this young man was challenging the white folks to get get off her off your ass into the street is the expression. The next speaker was somebody from the uh, thought that the outside agitators had done come down and stirred things up, and he was pretty pretty well right. Uh, and you hear repeatedly a small number of outsiders that were causing this trouble, and um, there were like maybe 500 people that supported us. And that what happened um, the next day uh, with the Russell House occupation and they couldn't, they, they arrested the kids, put them on a bus outside the Russell House and, and our war people surrounded the bus, they couldn't get the bus out. So that's when the National, that's when the National Guard came in and the, the High Patrol and the city police and the, the crowd was cheering the, the, the cops on. But um, by nightfall and then for days to come, the, the city cops were off the chain. They were tear gassing dormitories and people that weren't even involved would come running out of the dormitories and they would beat them. And so I remember being in a meeting saying, well, what can we do? And I said, well, we could dress up like city cops and tear gas dormitories and beat people, but we don't have to. So that was the time just kind of step back and, and let it run. And there were 600 people arrested. And that uh, I remember that there was like a situation where the people that had not been paying attention, they didn't really have a position on Vietnam. There, there were debates like Sigma Nu had 63 people arrested last night. Well, KA had 74. So it became kind of like a fun thing to do, go out and you know, to arrest the cops. And so what the cops did, they took all the guys they were arresting to the reception evaluation center prison system and shave their heads. So that was a little humiliating. But the next day, you could sure tell who'd been protesting because they let people go. They, they charged them a little bit and let them go. But they knew who it was. And so if you got arrested the second time, they weren't quite as polite to you. And so that was uh, that Friday. And then we're going to fast forward a little bit with this rally that was in Massey Greg Park, uh, adjacent to the university, where somebody that y'all will recognize is stirring up the trouble. And Daniel, that is the clip number, uh, yeah, number, clip number eight. It's queued up. There was to be an official parade in this city on Saturday. It has been canceled. That's Jane Fonda for those of you that don't recognize her. And this is happening all over the country, on military installations, in towns. All of those who are opposed to the war are having a People's Armed Forces Day to oppose the war. We are urging you all to come to the Capitol steps at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning to show your solidarity for the GIs who are protesting the war. This random construction workers, if, if, I, Daniel, if we can hear what this guy's saying, go ahead and let it play. But if you can't hear it, then stop it because it's pretty uh, arch, arch, archetypal of the Southern Redneck. We feel this is nothing but a communist movement. So we brought our flag rules. So let the rest of the world know what the Americans left in this country. Okay. He blamed it again on the communist. He knew that the leadership of the student protest was communist. Um, so that um, th those disturbances went on for days. There's a, a book at the at the website that the university put out called Months of May, um, analogizing somehow that trouble that was so intense in May stretched out over the whole year and made May seem like a whole year. And there's a breakdown on by day of the activities at the university. And um, what I want to do now, Daniel, can you put up that letter that I wrote after I went underground that was printed? This, you can, yeah, you have to scroll, I guess. This was the note that went through the window at the draft board that I wrote that they printed on the front page. Can you open that screen, Daniel, so we can see the whole thing at one time? Draw down your screen. 
so that this was a note that went through the draft board window um, that was um, read by the prosecutor uh, at my trial and, um, and then printed on the front page of the Gamecock when I wrote the letter that uh, is, Daniel, just, I, I'm sorry that you're not able to ex use the whole thing. If you were, I'm gonna tell everybody that the, uh, if you're using a, a Chrome browser, this opens as a smaller uh, PDF as you can see the pages and, and turn pages on. So let's not spend a whole lot of time on this. It's just that this was a letter that I wrote explaining what happened and I have disappeared. And uh, they, had, they had run a letter from Weatherford prior to that in the Gamecock. And so this is referred to as the red, white, and blue issue of the Gamecock. This is the first time they used color in that front page with the, the America, you become a monster, a self-consuming monster that thrives on the sons and daughters of humanity. Uh, that was in, in color, red, white, and blue. And so this, this was sent to the Gamecock. They ran the Gamecock, but they ran, they ran the article un, unexpurgated with, with uh, expletives in it. And um, they felt that uh, it was worth running, but Solomon bought blue fuse. He shut the Gamecock down, but SLED came in, searched and questioned everybody. And the university finally rallied behind free speech and, and kept the Gamecock going. But um, it was a, a fairly um, indictable uh, revolutionary uh, trope that I sent to the Gamecock that they ran. And that is also available for downloading. It's your pleasure, you can read it at the website. Thank you, Daniel. So what, before we get into GROW, um, I want to see if there are any other questions about Vietnam. There should be many questions. They don't all be asked now, but they will be unfolded as we uh, work together. Robert, seeing no questions. I'm not hearing Dr. Green. Nobody hears Dr. Green? Doc, we can't hear you. It says he's not muted. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Oh, loud and clear. Okay, yeah, sometimes Zoom just does that if you mute and unmute a few times. But um, one, one question in the chat, uh, one person wanted to get the sequence of events, Brett, exactly right. Was it that you went to jail, that after you were released, you had to go on the ground due to threats? Was that the sequence of events? Um, the, uh, the March, the, the draft board was in March. Mm -hmm. The trial was in late August. Um, I spent 12 days in, in jail. They took me, they took me straight to prison, first offense misdemeanor conviction. Shaved my head, gave me a uniform. And um, it was clear that they were gonna keep me for a while. And I'd had my bond posted uh, bef before even I was convicted and that the, the bondsman uh, was collaborating with the police and they made me sign. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to sign it. One of the reasons I stayed in jail for 12 days. They made me sign a declaration that I hope we can find a copy of someday that I would promise not to speak, utter, or print anything in derogation to the peace and dignity of the United States of America, the great state of South Carolina. I said, you must be out of your mind. And they kept bringing me back to court to do this. My mother would stomp on one foot. My lawyer would stomp on the other foot. I'm not signing that. 12 days later, I signed it. And um, by then I had decided that it's probably much safer for me to get across the state line. And so I left, uh, was underground for a year, uh, doing things that someday you may hear about and ended up back in South Carolina after I was captured. And, and that's when I spent most of the time in jail, but there was from the start to finish uh, about two years. And so Robert, I didn't quite understand the question in terms of sequence. No, that I think that's, that's about it. That, that just kind of getting the sequence in order. We, we will have a chat after this where we can like, people can talk one-on-one okay. -on -one and I get straight with them. And very quickly, you mentioned a commune as well that was around, when, where was that exactly in South Carolina? It started out on Park Street, a very big house on Park Street. Let's see, wait. No, College Street was the first one. 
the out of the house isn't there anymore, but right behind Capstone is this little piece of college street. There's some beautiful houses there, and it was there. And then it moved to Park Street and another nice big house right on Park Street. And so there were large uh, dwellings that accommodated a goodly number of people. And there were five people that were full-time staff there and uh, you know, a constant flow of people visiting and speakers and musicians and whatnot. And uh, that was a, a vibrant a vibrant place. And it was, it only lasted two years. And when the UFO got shut down, the people that, that well, the people that were the, the three that were running it, uh, plus their wife uh, and the other person um, left the state as they were told. I think that's about it for okay. questions so we can we can keep going. Well, what I want to do now is we're going to start with talking about the grassroots organizing workshop and grow um, had uh, the opportunity to um, start meeting pretty pretty soon after the Vietnam dust kicked up and I came back to Columbia in 19, the end of 73, maybe beginning of 74. And we started GROW as house meetings in people's living room. And, um, and by 77, uh, I was on a search for a building to institutionalize the movement. And that the, um, the had re in digging through old paperwork, I've found places where I had a few dollars down on different buildings before we ended up at, uh, at this one, which I'll show you here when I share my screen. And that was the Grove Building, it's still there. And um, we were there from 1977, we got um, a lease on it and we didn't pay anything for a couple of years because it didn't have a roof on it. Uh, it was poorly constructed uh, during World War II and there were 10 apartments upstairs, 10 rooms upstairs and three big rooms downstairs. And it had been different things. Uh, there was apartments upstairs and the downstairs had been a honky tonk, uh, Nadine's. And uh, this is in Olympia for, for those of you that aren't familiar with Columbia or uh, don't know what Olympia is, and it's the mill section. And it was the, the, the workers' housing area, very, very, very poor, uh, very white. Uh, and that um, the, uh, it's actually, if you look at a map of the Columbia area for the city of Columbia, you'll see pockets of the area that aren't in the city. And this was one of them. It was the, the city did not annex the poor and the black, poor white and the black areas. And so were these donuts. And fortunately, we were in a donut of the county uh, that it allowed us to start the Grow Cafe without DHEC breathing down our neck. And so when we got the building, um, we needed to do something to support it. And, to, and we started the cafe. And the Grow Cafe was a legend in its own time, in its own mind. And the cafe itself, uh, at one point, I think had seven full-time employees. They had a commune. They had one of the big manage manager houses on Whaley Street that they rented. And there were a number of, of um, uh, people that flowed through the cafe. The fellow that's doing our rehab work right now at the building that we bought, that the youngins decided they're going to call it Grow, uh, that the building is the Grow building for the Majeska School and the Progressive Network headquarters. But the building itself is for the community to be able to take advantage of and to help create that beloved community that we all need. And so the, the cafe staff ran the cafe and it had a brief period of time when it actually served me and uh, that didn't last long. Um, nobody wanted to handle it except this one guy, he quit. And so we had lunch that was, um, we never turned anybody away. We had beans and rice. One of the sayings of the, the fellow workers there was beans and rice, beans and rice, is this all we get for our sacrifice? Because that was the staple that we fed people. Now my office was right there and um, the um, uh, print shop started out upstairs in one room and the print shop then moved to a bigger room then moved downstairs. Uh, but the print shop was Harbinger Publication uh, and it uh, was part of the, the operation there. 
and the uh, the Harvard publication was a union shop. Industrial Workers of the World was a socialist union that uh, uh, goes back to the early 1900s, and uh, so the the print shop offered jobs. We had at one point seven people working in the print shop, and uh, in 1991 we started the Point newspaper, and um, and Becky came in uh, to the picture there in 1991. And um, she had written an article that she couldn't get run in the, the uh, bar association where she was working as a communications person. And so she brought it to, to, to grow. And we, we were putting out a, a weekly, uh, well, it started as a weekly, it didn't last long, it became a monthly pretty quickly, um, a monthly statewide news magazine. Uh, and we distributed it statewide, um, Becky or me or volunteers or UPS, we UPS them all over the place. Um, we actually were carrying it to Greenville and Charleston uh, and then UPSing it to smaller places. And we, we printed that for uh, 11 years. And obviously, 1991 was before the Internet. We were the first newspaper online, the point was. Uh, it's still debated as to when that was, 94 or 5. And that um, we started the, the pro progressive network at Grow. Um, after a long period of doing organizing, we started, the, we didn't start the network until 1996, but the Grove was there, uh, the building, we got a roof on it in 77, really kind of moved in in 78. Um, we got the Natural Guard as our fiscal sponsor of 501c3 that we could get grants with. And um, not the only grants we ever got were grants to work on uh, environmental issues. It was the Natural Guard was, uh, in essence, uh, started as a anti-nuclear organization, but uh, it connected the dots. We were involved in the national move against nuclear power then that um, was really driven around the country by people that knew each other from the anti-war movement. And the first big demonstration in America was in Seabrook, New Hampshire, 1977. We took up a carload from, um, from, um, from Grove to Seabrook, and uh, there were a bunch of us arrested there uh, 1,400 people arrested that first demonstration in Seabrook. And so we came home and replicated that. And um, the first big demonstrations that we did at the Savannah River plant started in um, about 1979. And that um, we had uh, work that we did before, during that time and before that time. Gro had a weekly meeting in this building that was topical. And we would have meetings about whatever was going on. And um, that the, uh, the cafe had entertainment. We shared the downstairs space when there was entertainment or where there was a, a meeting, we had to be, stop the entertainment. And so the, um, it was a quite a vibrant place. One of the benefits of it was that people could drop in anytime and find out what was going on without having to go to yet another boring meeting or even like today, another Zoom. You know, we're, we're at some point in the not too distant future, we're going to have our building next door to the Justice House. Um, fixed up genuine ADA bathrooms uh, in a little kitchen area and be able to, you can drop in anytime uh, that we're open and find out what's going on. We're, we have enough activities with jazz night and poetry night and films and et cetera to um, help a cash flow and to make the place more of a community center. And so that's something that we're, we're hoping will last for quite some time. And the, uh, the person that's doing the renovation for us, heading it up, Michael Gooding, was one of the managers of the Grow Cafe. And so uh, the Grow has uh, a footprint in a lot of people's lives and is remembered fondly. Uh, there were uh, times at the bar there where the Mayor Finley, uh, the mayor of Columbia, would be there. Uh, some of the editors from the state newspaper uh, it was the first kind of like gay, one of the gay above ground gay gathering places, and we had working people. And so people said it was kind of like it would have been the, the scene of Star Wars in the bar movie, the bar scenes in Star Wars, except that we were actually human beings. But it was a very eclectic place that, um, that was a, a great cross cultural organizing place. And um, let's see what we got next. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the grassroots organizing workshop uh, started the Natural Guard as its funding base. And um, one of the things that, uh, a, a fun thing to know 
is that the uh, painting on the outside of this Negro building is this picture here. That's the Incredible Hulk smashing through the wall at the Grow building. And those of you that know your, your, your funny books know that Dr. Bruce Banner was a mild-mannered nuclear physicist who tried to stop nuclear weapons testing and got irradiated. And it turned him into the Hulk, who then went on to a, a career that got perverted by, by uh, television. But the Hulk was actually an anti-war character. And so we, we kind of modeled ourselves after the Hulk. But we had a lot of really impressive uh, or, organizing efforts that uh, were national, uh, that were organized at growth through the Natural Guard. And uh, the one that we did, the first one we did in, in Barnwell, um, had um, uh, 5,000 people in a soybean field in 1979. And we had gotten a, we, we, we were VISTA, we had a VISTA grant. Jimmy Carter became the president of the United States of America in 1978. And we were in Grove. And they came upstairs. We had the upstairs people and the downstairs people at Grove. We tried not to be a class division, but um, it had it had appearances. And somebody came upstairs and said, there's this wild-eyed guy downstairs who wants to talk to you. And I went down and went out back to the storeroom and met with Dan Carney who was the state VISTA director. John Lewis, the, the later congressman of, of uh, Georgia, who was recently passed away, was the national director of VISTA at the time. And Jimmy Carter had put all these anti-war people in charge of VISTA, the Volunteers in Service to America, which was uh, defined as a domestic Peace Corps. So the Peace Corps and VISTA were being run by uh, anti-war activists. And so this guy said, can you put 10 people to work? I said, doing what? He said, Help, you know, helping stop hunger and, and the thing, you know, deprivation. I said, sure. And so we had, uh, okay, I said 14 people for several years paid uh, a very minimal salary uh, to basically um, have a revolution of values. And uh, this, is, this is when Vista was actually uh, operating under the notion that you don't feed people, you know, you, you, you give them fish they eat for a day, you teach them to fish they eat forever. And so it worked right into this notion of self-reliance and, and community control of your communities, but also uh, paid people, to, the staff people to live in Barnwell for a year. We rented a big old building down there. It was a really cool old grocery store with swinging doors on it. And we had staff on the ground in Barnwell for a year before the demonstration. Really classical type of organizing where the people that were there met with local people, uh, made friends with the farmers. The farmers did. The farmers weren't big on this nuclear stuff, and that uh, we did um, alternative energy presentations. We had the uh, uh, I can't remember the road the road show's name, but we had a, a road show that was an alternative energy road show that we took into schools. And so uh, the first time that we did this anti nuclear demonstration, uh, we had been there for nearly a year had rented a soybean field right outside the gate of the, the bomb plant. And the bomb plant, um, for those of you that don't know and should know, was then and still is, uh, 70 years later, the state's largest single site employer. And that the um, there were, oh, maybe 15,000 people working there. 312 square mile facility, making plutonium. They were a plutonium production facility that then shipped it off to New Mexico to, turn into the next piece for the bombs. And um, there are still, I think last check, 11,000 people there and they don't make anything. So it, it's been a jobs program for a long time. But um, we had this um, soybean field rented, uh, had brought in trailers, built a stage and had a press conference at the state house announcing this. And that um, uh, we had Dr. John Goffman as one of our speakers. Goffman uh, was the, um, attributed to be the uh, discoverer of plutonium. And he said that the Savannah River plant was the greatest uh, threat to national security of anything because con uh, just regular conventional bombs dropped on the bomb plant could cause the evacuation. He did the, the, the calculations of how long you would have as the wind was blowing in the right direction to evacuate uh, uh, Washington and New York City and Boston as millions of people were killed because there is all this incredible nuclear waste there. 
So one of our lines was the bomb plants. The, it was the uh, weapon that's being dropped on the people it's intended to defend. So we were arguing, arguing and organizing locally for people to realize the threat that was posed by this. And so that first rally that we did, we worked for a year. We printed, it, I think the first run was 50,000 posters. It's a series of posters that we did that will be available online. Really, really very good stuff. And Dan, you got that clip of that guy that uh, played the, for the first rally we did down there. But this, we had, um, uh, we had uh, monks from Hiroshima. We had the people that created plutonium. We had doctors and lawyers and uh, monks. And we had entertainment that evening that we didn't tell who, anybody who was going to be the entertainment. Uh, because we didn't want to be seen as a pop festival. We had 5,000 people, and they didn't know that this guy that Daniel was going to kill the song was going to was going to play on our stage that night. Daniel, play that tune. Um, you may have noticed that that was Jackson Brown, and that um, Jackson Brown was at the height of his career at the time, and that um, he, um, obviously, you heard him introduce himself. Really, really wonderful fellow. And he did these uh, benefits for us. That um, he, that was the first one that he, he did uh, at uh, the bomb plant, and he did one at um, the um, township auditorium, of course. That um, it was the first time the township had uh, two sellout shows back to back, and this was at a time when that song, "Late for the Sky" album, had just, and uh, he was quite quite popular. So we didn't let anybody know about it. I still have people many years later that are still mad at me because they left before Jackson came on the stage. But um, that benefit that they did that evening for us at Township, um, I got to introduce them and, uh, twice. And uh, as when the show was over with, this little fellow that plays the violin for him, um, he's their bodyguard. <laughs> he said he's a really dangerous guy. He handed me a paper bag with $17,000 in cash in it. And, um, what, what's it's happening? Like a, it's a lot of feedback. A lot of feedback? Yeah. Um, Becky's telling me I'm feeding back. So I'm having trouble with my, my sound here, but I'm going to keep talking. But Robert, what, what we're, I didn't realize we're, we've got only 20 minutes left for questions. So let's, let's shut me up and let's go to the, to the questions. Yeah. Sure, definitely. Um, so let's, let's go ahead. If, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat again. A um, couple of questions right off the bat, Brett. Uh, one uh, was from Cecil. You said, the Grove Building is still standing. What is it used for now? The building was sold out from under us without any notice. After 22 years we were there, a young person grew up and inherited it. And the first thing we heard was somebody, a neighbor called and said, hey, somebody cut the locks off your door. So it was really unfortunate. The, our, our departure was under duress. But um, the building was bought by a fellow that still owns it, and he has the Grow Antique Store there now. Uh, the upstairs is Art Studios, and it's worth a trip. It's at the corner of Old Bluff and uh, Whaley. And that if you were going down Assembly Street and made a hard right at the old baseball park, you come up to a stop sign, and there it is. One of the amusing and amazing things is that the Grow Building at 18 Bluff Road had trouble when we got the Natural Guard going at 18 Bluff Road. The National Guard is at 1800 Bluff Road. And we got a lot of phone calls and they got our mail and it was amusing for a long time. All right, so another another quick question. Uh, perhaps Brett might be willing to talk about funding and support for Grove 2.0. Well, it's a harder time to do what we did back in the day, which was we just, we, we created jobs. I mean, I'm Becky and I are still taking in print work uh, if your club, church, school, or civic organization needs printing, we're the only, sometimes the only, one of the few union print shops in South Carolina. So we were doing that. We made money the old-fashioned way to support our social justice habit. One of the precepts of that was that the revolution will not be grant-funded. You know, the more effective you get, the less likely you are to get money. And the fact is, we need to offend some of the people that give people money because they need offending. And so we are going to maintain our, our C3 grant stuff uh, we will get some grants in, um, but we're also going to have activities there, and we need to monetize the building. So uh, Nikki Finney, the poet lord of South Carolina, has agreed to do a, a regular, I think a monthly poetry night there. We have a great jazz band that wants to play there that um, 
uh, Marjorie Hammock, our co-chair, uh, is a, a huge jazz fan, and she uh, has following. And so we're going to be doing things like that uh, to monetize it. And we're going to need to be getting everyone that's on this thing to, to become a recurring donor. I mean, if you can't afford $10 or $25 a month, the lowest you can give is 3 bucks. And trust me, you won't notice it. It's painless. We come in at night, take the money out of your bank account, boom, you won't miss it. So that's the type of stuff we need to do. If a movement is going to work, it has to be a popular movement that's owned by the people. So damn it, this is your movement, so you got to step up and pay for it. The building is owned by the 501c3, the Progressive Network. It's not owned by anybody. Becky and I put our home up to collateralize it. And so y'all need to help get this building off of our property because that's Becky's retirement money. And don't tell her because she might, I might, when I die, she gets the land and sells it. And, but we don't want to give her any ideas, so y'all keep that under your hat. More questions? Yeah, please. Uh, any any other questions at all um, about what we've discussed this evening? Again, I think one of the things, just to put this in a greater historical context here, is that when we tend to talk about the civil rights and anti-war movements, um, historically, we tend to, to kind of stop them with the mid-70s and in the Vietnam War and the mm -hmm. like. But I think what this what, what Brent's talked about this evening really shows how much of this work continued on into the late 1970s, into the 80s, and so forth, and how it, it laid the foundation for a lot of protests even today. So there's actually another interesting question for you in the chat, Brett, um, about um, your, your letter specifically. It says in your letter, you spelled America with a K. Why? Well, uh, I think Franz Kafka did that. Cecil's nodding his head. He may, he may know I'm, I'm you know, the author wrong. That was a, something that was used to spell America by anti-fascists that were writing things in the 30s when, uh, during the Spanish American, uh, the Spanish, the Spanish revolution that Americans went and fought in. And so America, uh, it used a K. It's funny you ask that because the solicitor asked the same thing. And um, I, I told him that it, it, it was reference to the fact that it's not the America we know and love that we see today. So I don't know if everybody like is bored or wants to go home or has no questions that I that elucidated so clearly. But um, We'll take more questions or we'll all go home. Daniel's got another tune to play, so don't leave. It's a really good one. Okay. Well, R Robert, I, I do, you touched on something that I can oh, tell Oh, wait. Um, I see, sorry. Uh, Debbie has her hand raised. So, uh, Debbie, uh, go ahead, please. Unmute yourself. Can it? Okay, Brett, I was just wondering if you could, um, and I wrote this a long time ago, if you could reflect a little bit on, I have always been, frankly, kind of shocked by the lack of student and faculty activism at the University of South Carolina since I moved here. And I'm just wondering what your reflections are in terms of what has happened, what you, you know, were part of, are part of, lived through, and what has been put into place to make it it, it, it's just so surprising to me. Remember this quote from many revolutionaries for a long time. Education is the placenta of the state. So those that control education control the shape of the child. And so there you go. We got a minimally adequate education. That Tim Scott doesn't even know we're a racist society. I mean, people that went to the Majeska school know that. But, sweetie, they lied to a lot of us growing up in South Carolina. I had that, that book that said that the ignorant, superstitious colored people was happy until them damn Yankees came down here and stirred things up. And so people my age that learn that are still the ones that are running the show here. The trustees at the University of South Carolina aren't really, they, the whole thing is about them being able to have nice seats for football games. And that we now have uh, the, the smallest amount of state tax dollars going into the university here than any university. It's the seventh most expensive state university in America. And so what's had to be done is they've taken in more out-of-state students than in-state students. So that's reflective of a lack of concern by the people that dole out the money, what little they do, in terms of educating people in South Carolina. And that when people stick their head up here, it gets bit off. And because we are southern by the grace of god and stupid by choice smart people grow up and leave so we're waiting for them to come home the comebacks and so 
they're y'all better gear up and get the people you know that left town come back and to hurry up because this is a tremendous opportunity for people with a plan to assume the role of the mighty because the republicans are shooting themselves and each other and everybody else in the foot the democrats have no clue what to do and so it's a great time to organize and one of the things on it debbie did i somehow answer that question I have my own theories and you confirm them and I just really wanted to hear your reflections on that. Yeah. Robert, sure, thank can you. Can I just add to that? Because I, I, I think I have a, a slightly different point of, point of view being a recent graduate of U of SC. There are some students there who are involved in protest movements. And the pro part of the problem is that they don't receive the kind of coverage they probably should. Um, part of it is that in, in the last few years, you have seen some movements against, say, um, the the names of, of buildings on campuses and, and that kind of thing but i will also say as a college professor and granted i don't teach at u of sc anymore i teach at cloud university i think the biggest problem is that a lot of college students are simply overwhelmed mm. uh they're overwhelmed with with i have students who work multiple jobs and they're going to school at the same time i have a lot of students at claflin who are first generation college students i think for a lot of them college is the place where they are exposed for the first time to a multitude of ideas. So some of them may be thinking, I want to protest, but I'm not exactly sure how to do so or why I should do it. So I, I totally get your question there, Debbie. I think it's it's a really good question. Um, but I think I think Brett is certainly right too. But there there are some there's a lot of work that has to be done with a lot of these students in terms of getting them more socially active and aware. And, and there are a, a number of good professors. But one of the things is the, the sorting that happens as to who goes to college. When, when I graduated from, Bu from Buford High School, it cost $900 a semester to go here. And that um, everybody that was, had the money and that was kind of a, a larger middle class then actually, was expected to go to college. And so we had a lot of people going to college that didn't quite know why they were there. But today, it cost a whole lot more and there's a much more emphasis on the money-making tracks and the liberal arts tracks and much more emphasis on the business track. And so there, there's been kind of a winnowing of the, the funnel that directs the students to the schools. And as we have the majority now of students from out of state, they're not as plugged into what's happening here, uh, nor do they want to stay around here. And so I, it's a, we're looking forward to your white paper on that, Debbie, that we can share with, the, with everyone. And so, Robert, I, I'm hearing no other questions. I think that we can um, speak briefly about the next class, and then we're going to play another rousing tune to let people uh, stretch. And then if anybody's left, we can, can chat amicably. And um, we want to thank everybody for coming and listening to me. And the reason I'm doing all the talking is most of the people I know that were there are dead or gone. Um, and so with some, some work, we will really strengthen the web presence and get more voices into this thing. Becky does have a grant for another book that picks up after History Denied that's going to take that that linear organizing that we we followed Majeska with and that the the analysis that she had she got from her mother who got from W.E.B. Du Bois. So this is this is these notions about getting together, working together um, and sharing uh, we, all the oppressed people are in the same class. We're working class folks. And that, that we have a commonality of problems is something that we are continuing to organize around. And that has, we haven't missed a beat with that with, from the time we worked with Majeska when she was our advisor at GROW, to the time that we started the Natural Guard, to the time we started the Progressive Network, to now, our line is the same. And uh, I appreciate y'all for listening. And so next week, this time, uh, we're going to be talking about the Progressive Network. We may pick up on some things we bobbled here tonight, and it's it, it's our fault. We have so much. I was telling you, Becky got another grant to do a book that we've been working on. She's been working on now for two years. We had given grow papers to the state archives, and we could get one box at a time. And finally, Graham Duncan said, "Oh hell, bring a truck. We give them all to you." And so they gave us fifty boxes back that covered like thirty years of work. That it's like drinking from a fire hose. And especially when you're involved and, and Becky's rabbit holing is a new uh, word that she's made up. When you pick up something to find something and you realize there's something else and all of a sudden you're like, forgot what it was you were supposed to be looking for. 
So we're going to continue doing that until it makes sense and share it with you. But next week, uh, we're going to pick up uh, in 1992 when the first progressive legislators in South Carolina are elected. And I'd mentioned earlier Julian Bond in Georgia in 68. And there were progressive legislators in North Carolina about that time. It was 20 years later before it happened in South Carolina. This goes back to that problem that we have in South Carolina. And so Joe Neal and Gilda Cobb Hunter were elected in 92. Um, we were at Grow. We jumped on them right away, did stories in the point about them. And, the, and that Joe and Gilda stayed around and worked with us. And we, they were founding members of the Progressive Network in 96. So we'll pick up the story then. And that the, uh, the, the, the work continues, but I want you to know the shoulders that you stand on uh, are way more than me and Becky. Uh, and Becky certainly has carried more load than she certainly has been pray, paid for or appreciated for. And so we need to sing our praises to Becky because she really is uh, somebody who did a lot of stuff that we didn't get together to show you tonight. But we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. And so, Daniel, are you ready to play us out of here with a new tune?